Hey folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiatoria. So just a little look at the Afghan Pulwar. I have shown, in fact, this specific sword before, and I have talked about Afghan weapons. If you're interested in Afghan weapons of the 19th century specifically, then um, search in my videos and you'll find my previous video there. But um, this is now going off to a new owner. I have um, sold this, so I just thought I'd make a quick video about it before I send it away. Um, and um, I actually promised to talk a little bit more about pulwars, and I realised that I kind of didn't. Um, so this is my opportunity. Um, fundamentally, pulwar is, as you can tell, a very similar word to tulwar. Okay, and the Indian, um, the most common sword in India in the 19th century was the tulwa or talwa um, and you will see that they are fairly similar sword types in fact the blades that you find on them you can say they're identical okay yes definitely some blades were made in persia some were made in afghanistan some were made in india um, some were made in europe and um, you find all of those blades on either afghan or indian hilts I will also say that you find tulwar hilts in Afghanistan, um, what, what we now call Afghanistan. Um, and of course Afghanistan butts up against the northwest frontier of India. And it was always a, well I won't say always, but for centuries it's been a very volatile area. And that border has been much contested over. And of course it's now, uh, that region is now in what we call Pakistan, but of course Pakistan used to be part of, of India. and. Um, that in the 19th century there were various points at which the um, Afghan government was uh, at certain points it was a puppet state essentially and it was um, allied with with Britain um, with Britain's imperial interests um, but there were other points at which um, the uh, the Afghans were opposed to Britain um, alongside that the Afghans also had um, several conflicts with the Persian Empire, which was to their sort of uh, west and south. So, um, and in fact, there were border dis disputes with the Persians. So, despite the fact that we think of, I think probably most Western people think of Af Afghanistan as a place far, far away um, that has a lot of internal problems, um, actually in the 19th century, they had a pretty organized um, standing army for most of the 19th century and um, as well as lots of um, tribal kind of irregular, should we say, forces. But they were also kind of used as a pawn um, b between Britain and Russia to a certain extent. There were certain points at which they were allied with Britain, certain points they were allied with Russia. Um, in that part of the world, in Asia, in the 19th century, the two big influential imperial powers after France's defeat during the Napoleonic Wars were essentially Russia and Britain. And a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of the conflicts in the region and the, the layout of the map, the borders, were a result of um, Anglo-Russian politics, essentially, um, which, of course, you know, that's crap. Um, the only people who benefit from politics usually are politicians. But anyway, I won't venture into that realm of that. Common soldiers, that's what we focus on on this channel. Uh, and so anyway, lots of Afghans, um, of various different, uh, what we would now call Afghans, but of course there used to be lots of different tribal um, peoples within Afghanistan, some of which liked each other, some of which didn't like each other. It's still the case today. Of course, there's religious and tribal divisions within Afghanistan. But they did have a native style of sword, which was this, and is known as the Polwar. Now, as far as I know, Polwar is simply the regional um, version of Tolwar. They are the same word, as far as I'm aware. It's just that Polwar and Tolwar are um, said slightly differently, depending where you're, whether you're in India or in Afghanistan. Um, interestingly, the origin of these swords is probably pretty much the same and probably they um, came about in around the 16th century um, curved blades, incidentally, many of you will think of curved blades as um, something kind of indigenous to, to Asia, but in actual fact the most common swords in India before, before about the 15th, 16th century, the most common swords in India were straight. Um, and forms of broadsword, of, of both single and double-edged sword, uh, predominated in India. And um, Afghanistan always being fairly low on natural resources until modern times w with um, gas and oil, um, but fairly low with natural resources in historical periods, was always a relatively poor uh, region and had to 
for the large part, ship in quite a lot of weapons from neighbouring areas. So, of course, even up until the 20th century, you would find Indian weapons in Afghanistan, you'd find British weapons in Afghanistan, Russian weapons in Afghanistan, um, <laughs> which of course goes into modern times with tanks and such like, um, but equally Persian weapons. And this is the important part, is that this type of curved sabre blade essentially seems to have come into both Afghanistan and then India from Persia, which is one of the reasons why weapons of these types are often classed under the category of Indo-Persian weapons. Because very clearly there are things which have a strong Indian, um, sort of specifically Indian look and, and design to them, but they nevertheless are intrinsically linked with Persian weapons. So this type of blade, um, which can be, of, as I mentioned, of various origins, it can be from Persia, can be from Arabic countries, can be um, indigenous to Afghanistan or can be made in India very commonly um, or indeed can be European because the Europeans, particularly the Germans, manufactured sabre blades in huge numbers and as mentioned in one of my previous videos um, there were thousands, literally thousands of um, German sabre blades being imported into India um, between the 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th centuries. Um, so lots of Indian swords had European blades, or German blades specifically, sometimes British, usually German. Um, so the blades interchangeable. Now the hilts, let's have a look at them. So you will see there are two very obvious large differences between a tulwar and a polwar. So if I get my face out of the way, the theory is it should focus on the hilts. There we go. Now, as you can see, the tulwar, the one I'm wiggling here, has a disc pommel and a more or less straight crossguard or quillons, quillons. Um, the polwa, on the other hand, has a hemisphere pommel, very characteristic, and I'll talk a bit more about that in detail in a minute, and it has dropped, um, drooping down quillons. Now, we've talked a lot about um, tulwars in this channel in the past, so I'm not going to talk hugely about the tulwar here other than to say and to remind you that one of the reasons that a tulwar has this disc pommel is to, and this is documented in 19th century sources, is to encourage you and perhaps even force you, depending on the size of your hand and the size of the hilt, to keep an angle like that between the sword blade and the wrist. With European swords, with sabres for example, I'll just grab a sabre here, there is nothing to enforce you doing that, and so usually when you give a cut with a sabre, you let the blade extend out and the wrist open. Okay, I've talked about this many times in videos before, so I won't belabor the point. Uh, whereas if you try and do that with a tulwa, the disc sticks into the bottom of your hand, or even your wrist, depending on the size of the disc and the size of your hand, um, and becomes very uncomfortable. And you can extend the blade to about that point, but it gets uncomfortable beyond that. Now, why would you do this? Well, simply to encourage the draw cut, okay? And so we know from numerous 19th century sources, mostly British, at least the sources that I've read, mostly British, um, that this style of cutting, of drawing the edge across the target, was what Indian swordsmen sought to do and practiced to do, because this produces a very long drawing cut and a horrific bloody wound. Um, so they're not hacking so much as slicing, okay? Now, if we move over to the polwar, you will see very um, quickly that one of the main differences here is we are not so forced to do that with the polwar. Because it has this, um, this nice hemisphere, let's just focus on that for a minute, because it has this nice hemispherical guard, come on camera focus, it's not going to do it, no, okay, um, because it has this hemispherical guard it's not as uh, painful, it's not as uh, enforcing on your hand to prevent you from extending the blade out. Now I have to say, this hilt's a tiny bit small for my hand, so it kind of has a similar effect anyway. But what's nice is polwars, at least to a, a sabre and to a western hand, polwars are more comfortable generally to hold than tulwars are. Um, so why might this be? Um, well, I don't know. <laughs> it, you have to point out to begin with, the tulwar hilt is very specific to India, okay, to the Indian subcontinent. And it was common all over India, but that, 
that kind of ethos of forcing your grip to hold it a certain way, we can maybe find not parallels so much as other examples of grips which force you to hold it in a certain way if we look maybe at, um, at something like the Viking Age sword hilt, um, perhaps if we look at something like the Basilard or the Rondel Dagger or things like this, there are other weapons out there that have hilts which force you to hold them in a certain way or rather limit the ways that you can hold them. Um, but the Towa is really, really specific, really, really noted. So much so that I've always been kind of surprised that the disc pommel caught on as widely as it did and spread and just became the predominant type of sword. That's always surprised me. Um, usually weapons which are very particular are more uh, more narrow in appeal and usually the generic kind of the more normal looking weapons are the ones which are more common. So the Talwa really stands out uh, from weapon history in my mind in that sense. But the Polwar is more of a compromise. It's almost like they wanted a Tolwa, but were like, oh, these Tolwars are a bit of a pain in the ass to use. It's almost like if a modern 21st century Western sword practitioner got a Tolwa and loved Tolwars, but found them really like me and found them quite uncomfortable to use, like me, and went, oh, I'll just modify the design slightly and ended up with this. Something else I should mention as well is that not all Indian tulwars have such a flat disc as this one. Some of them do almost bridge the gap between this and this in that some of them are more of a conical and they slope away from the hand. Um, and it's, so it's very clear that some Indian people didn't like the completely flat disc. Some of them preferred a slightly coned disc because it's a little bit easier on the hand and you can extend the blade out a little bit further. Another possible reason, apart from just general comfort and, and uh, compromise, for the Afghan Polwa to have this type of domed pommel is cavalry. Now, I'm saying this because this is a theory that I know that people will throw at me. I personally don't think it's the, the reason, I don't think it's the cause, but if we were to assume that in India they didn't use lots of cavalry and in Afghanistan they did use lots of cavalry, then this type of pommel, whereby you can extend the blade more, would make more sense, in theory, on paper, if those things that I just said were true, okay? Because if you're on horseback, you want to be able to reach out further from your horse, because it's harder to get closer to an opponent on horseback than it is on, on foot. Um, so you need to be able to reach further, and especially if you're hitting people who are standing on foot on the ground, you want to be able to reach down to hit them from as far away as possible. So in that sense, this type of pommel would make some sense, and I can understand why some of you might be thinking, oh, well, maybe it's a cavalry um, adaptation of the tulwa to allow more versatile use on, foot, on um, horseback, but I don't think that at all is the reason, and the reason is, as far as I can tell, um, at no point in history was Afghanistan more cavalry centric than India. It, as far as I can tell, India has always been really, has always considered cavalry hugely important and tulwars were used extensively right the way up until the First World War, believe it or not, by Indian horsemen. So Indian horsemen didn't have a problem with using tulwars um, and in fact some British officers serving in India chose to use tulwars on horseback as well. Um, and ironically in Afghanistan, whilst they did have cavalry and they did have horses, they don't seem to have been a greater cavalry nation than India was. Um, and they had lots of people fighting on foot um, as well, so I, I, don't, I don't think that this is a cavalry adaptation for the Tolwa. What I think this is, is an uh, an Indian hilt coming into Afghanistan and then the Afghans going, hmm, don't really like that so much. Now, there's another thing to consider. In 19th century, and this will, this will I'm sure, encounter some uh, opposition uh, when I put this video up, but 19th century British writers are clear on the fact that Indian hilts are often too uncomfortable for European hands to hold because Indian people were smaller. Now, if we look at the modern world, at least certainly uh, people of Indian origin who live in Western countries, they are, as far as I know, not smaller on average than Europeans at all. 
But you have to remember this is the 19th century and in the 19th century there were huge swathes of India where fundamentally people didn't get an awful lot of protein. Um, and if we look at photographs from about the 1850s right the way through to, to the end of the 19th century, it is clear that in parts of India, not all of India, but in parts of India the average height of uh, local people was small compared to the average height of um, British people. So that's possible. I'm not going to throw it out. However, there's an exception to that, and that is the Punjab. Um, not only the Punjab, there are other areas of India where there are above average height people, but um, there is a picture I have in my possession which shows Lord Roberts meeting a load of Sikh soldiers. And Lord Roberts happens to have been, Frederick Roberts this is, um, it, he happens to have been quite a small guy. So you've got this small, very high ranking uh, I can't remember what he was now, he's a quite like field marshal or something I think by that point. Um, but he, he was a short guy, he only looks about 5 foot 4, 5 foot 5, with these huge towering 6 foot 2 uh, Sikh cavalry troopers towering over him. So I don't really hold with the whole theory that uh, Indian helps are, uh, are explained by hand size. Um, I think in some cases it was true, uh, but there's a huge variety in Tolwar. Um, hilt sizes and my observation some people don't agree with this and I point that out but my observation is that if you look at high quality or high like expensive high status talwa hilts they are often not always but they are often bigger uh, in proportion than cheaper talwa hilts now that makes a lot of sense to me in that I know that in Europe uh, social class went it hand in hand very often, not always, but very often as an average with social class. Um, so social class went in, so in hand in hand with size rather. Um, so clearly if you are selectively bred because you're a member of the nobility and you get a better diet and you get better medical care and uh, just a healthier life, a less chance of disease hopefully, uh, then you're more likely to grow bigger. Okay, um, So it makes sense to me that um, higher status people generally were probably a bit bigger than lower status people. Um, so that's a factor as well. Now, Afghans. Well, this, is, this is the point that I'm working around to uh, in application of this sword. I have seen a number of 19th century uh, British sources that describe the people of what's now Afghanistan, the Afridis and the various other tribes of Afghanistan, as big. Now this, these are British writers who are used to Indian soldiers. They're used to living in India. Many, many British people were born in India. Many almost considered themselves Indian in the 19th century. These days we think about, um, because of you know, politics and history and the way things that panned out with Indian independence and everything else, we now think of British people and Indian people and the British people were the rulers uh, and the Indian people were the sort of underlings and it wasn't as clear cut as that. There was a large class of um, high status Indian people who lived you know, very, very good lives with a high degree of personal autonomy and everything else. There were Indian officers in the British Army, huge numbers of them. Um, and equally many of the British officers and British living in India considered themselves Anglo-Indians. They considered themselves ethnically British, of course, but they associated themselves with India. Rudyard Kipling is a famous example of this, of course, and you know, he, he, was, he was born in India and he considered himself an Anglo-Indian. He didn't consider himself an English person, he considered himself a, a, a British, an ethnic British person from India. Um, now, um, these people writing these sources, many of them, not all of them, but many of them had been born in India or were from families who had a large contingent in India. Um, and they were used to Indian people. Some of them had been based out in India for uh, decades, in some cases even a century. Um, and um, when they saw Afghans and when they wrote about Afghans, they wrote about them as large people. They considered the Afghans big compared to most Indian people. So, that being the case, it could be that when, when us uh, modern Westerners, well, when I say us, I realise that many of you watching this are in India and China and other countries, so, but me, talking about myself, when, when, a, uh, when a European person picks up a tool, often you'll think, I wish the hilt was a bit bigger. So perhaps the, um, this type of pommel was an adaptation or to, to essentially make the Tulwa hilt more comfortable for larger Afghan ha hands. Now, I'm not saying that's correct, 
I'm just saying that's a possible theory based on the 19th century sources, because 19th century sources, as I've mentioned, describe a lot about size and ethnicity and different sizes between different tribal and ethnic groups. Um, so that's a possible another theory. Finally, um, I, last thing I'm going to say about this, uh, the, the pommel in specific, is that this is made of sheet metal. Okay, so this is like a cup and at the end is a disc. Okay, so you've got a cup and a flat disc. It's hollow inside. There's no real mass to it. If that was solid, it would be way too heavy and the sword would be too back weighted. Okay, so it's, it's hollow, um, but uh, it's a very specific shape. Now it's possible that this has a, uh, shall we say, ethnographic cultural significance, this shape. Um, and this is not something I've researched. Um, equally, I don't know an awful lot about the real, and I'm not sure that anybody does know an awful lot about the really early history of the Talwa. It is possible because this type of blade, this type of sabre blade, came into India from places like Afghanistan, ultimately from Persia. It is possible that this style of hilt is an earlier style, or is related to earlier styles, styles Tolwa. So sometimes, just like with evolution, when you get things evolving from point 0.1 to 2 to 3 to 4 to 5 to 6, over here you've got point 0.6, but if you look back in region here, you've still got point 0.2. Um, because they haven't got to point six as it's travelled further away from the origin of source, uh, from, from where it started. So um, it's possible that this style of pommel actually relates to earlier, an earlier development uh, or an earlier point in the development of the Tolwa hilt. So the final thing I'm going to say is about the guard. These drooped um, hilts with uh, what I believe are lotus flowers, something like that, um, they, they are very, very characteristic of pulwas, pulwas. and um, absolutely, um, this is, you know, this combination of these drooped quillons with the little, um, with the little flower ends and the, and the um, hemispherical hollow pommel. The swell in the middle, the grip, if we just look at the grip, completely normal like a tulwa, okay? There's really no, the difference between a tulwa and a pulwa in the grip, nothing at all. Okay, so what defines the Afghan pulwa is the pommel and the drooping um, flower-ended guard. As I say, the blades can be interchangeable. Um, so, uh, um, one final thing about that guard, some of you will say, could that catch blades? It technically could. You could, I mean, it's made of steel, it's fairly strong and everything like that. You could technically lock, catch someone's blade in there. Yes, I guess so. Um, you could e equally do that with a Tolwa guard as well, um, to some extent. But um, whether that would be advantageous or not, I'll leave that up to you to decide. Um, and final thing to say is Tolwas and Polwas are very much designed to be used with a dial or shield, a round circular shield on the left arm of various sizes, sometimes buckler size, sometimes massive. Um, and that is how they're usually used historically, was, was together with a large shield. So they are predominantly attacking weapons, with the shield being predominantly, of course, the defensive weapon. For that reason, um, they're not, unlike European swords of the same date, of the 19th century, 18th, 19th century, um, they're not particularly optimised to taking edge damage, for example. Um, and they... Um, generally have very fine edges. They can be incredibly hard and good. They can be woots. I suspect this blade that I'm holding here might be woots, but it would need to be etched for that to be uh, made certain. Um, but they, um, they're they not as, I wouldn't say they're not as robust in the edge at, at um, taking um, blows in guards in the way that if you were trying to use it like a sabre. Um, and of course, you know, they don't have as much hand protection as a sabre because they don't need it because you're using it with a buckler or a shield. Um, very occasionally you find ones with a knuckle bow, and more commonly on Indian swords. So there we go, there's a view of the pulwa. I hope that kind of covers the topic. I'm sure there are people out there who know a lot more about these than me. Um, this is the only one I've ever owned, but hopefully I will get more in the future. Cheers folks. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe, follow us on Facebook. You can buy t-shirts through Spreadshirt, support us on Patreon, or follow us on Pinterest. Thank you.